Uh, all right, well, let's let you, Fred, if you're ready to, I mean, Kevin, if you're ready to go, we'll let you just charge ahead and then we'll just do our little meeting. You'll walk on the stair around after. All righty. Well, uh, I thank you all for coming in here today and thank you, Roger, and everybody for inviting me to give a chance to talk to you all about how I use N1MM. Uh, a little bit about me to start with. Uh, first off, before I start, I, I've got a little bit of drainage. I've got some allergies and it's fall season back here. So uh, just about every presentation I give, I've got some drainage. So I may have to, you'll hear me coughing a bit and muting, but uh, I, I got to live with that uh, as we go through. A little about me, I've been licensed since 1975, but I didn't get into contesting until the early 2000s. Uh, I've done fairly well, <clears throat> started moving up in the ranks and uh, started getting some regional wins. And uh, then I was invited to the NQ4I Superstation, which is where I really began to learn about contesting. So I've got some experience in both uh, little pistol stations like me here with a tribander at 50 feet and some wires, and then a little bit more uh, aluminum up in the air. And uh, I really hadn't been using spots at all. I was completely unassisted until getting over to NQ4I and there they introduced me to what spots uh, could do. And they used a program called wind test. And it was at that point that I began exploring and N1MM is a great program and there's a ton of things in there to help with spots. And as I began to learn more and more about it, uh, some of the old timers started picking up and using some of the techniques that I'm going to talk to you about over uh, at the super station. And uh, I've begun moving up even a little bit higher with some several uh, top 10 and top five wins in uh, the single operator low power assisted categories. So I've got a little bit of experience using this and I hope I can pass some of the information on to you. And as we talk, if you guys have any questions at all, don't hesitate to speak up. Uh, once I start sharing my screen, I lose the ability to see the chat room. So uh, if, if there's a chat comes in and somebody sees it, please go ahead and let me know. Uh, uh, but you got to shout it out with uh, uh, a question if you have one. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll start in with this. Uh, let's see, screen, share one. And is everybody seeing my screen here? Yes. Great. Yes. Well, let's go ahead and move this up then, if it'll start. <clears throat> Proving rate using N1M spot capabilities. If you want to get hold of me after this, you can look up my email on qrz.com or Roger's got it. And give a holler. I'll be happy to answer anything I can. The thing about contesting is rate. And... It's kind of odd to start out a presentation with a, something from another guy's presentation, but Gary W9XT said, watch the rate meter. When it's below what it should be, basically do something else. And that's the whole focus of what drove me into figuring out how to use the N1MM spots is rate. It's amazing how you can get some good rates using these spots. Before we launch into this, uh, I still get people asking, and I see it on the reflectors, uh, uh, fairly often, that using spots makes you assisted. That's not true. You can do your own self-spotting and benefit from those generated spots as well. And we'll talk about a couple of ways N1MM generates those spots. Spots alone aren't something that's going to help you. You have to be able to move on to a, a, a pileup, which spots, a lot of times there are pileups, and then evaluate real quickly, is my station capable of busting through this or am I just wasting my time here? And one of the things that happens is spots, people think that spots are for mostly chasing molts. I kind of turn that on its head. For me now, chasing spots is more of a rate issue and the molts tend to come. But we'll talk about some strategies that later. But if you get yourself bogged down saying, I got to get this malt, I got to get this malt, using N1MM spots is actually going to slow you up more than uh, uh, just trying to run does. And these techniques work well if you're a SO2R op or if you have dual watch capability. You can use this 
CQ on your main radio or VFO and chase spots with the second one. And since N1MM has a uh, capability of macros, so you can send reports uh, just by hitting an F key. Uh, and it also will send wave files <clears throat> the same way. Uh, it really works well if you're doing that type of operation. And the last thing, as I mentioned, I picked up some of these uh, first off at a super station, and then I brought them back into my little pistol station, and it's made a tremendous difference. So just about anybody can benefit from these things. One of the things I often hear is spot people that do assisted is point and click type operation. And I hope when you get done, you'll see that that's true, but it certainly doesn't encompass all that uh, is involved in assisted operation. Uh, a competitive cost contester has to do a lot more than point and click. You also got to verify the spot's accurate. You got to listen to what's sent. Uh, you're going to have to run stations to be competitive. Doesn't mean you have to, but uh, running stations is definitely the way to get up into the top. And it really helps to turn that VFO, even though you're doing assisted too. It's just about every time I tune a VFO, I'll find a station uh, that hasn't been spotted yet. And that's worthwhile. Since not everybody may be uh, up to speed of what all the windows are in N1MM, we'll cover some of these things. This is what we call the N1MM info window, or talk about the rate meter. And this stuff on the left right here where the green columns are, that tells you, it says that the thing there, Qs are 10. Let me see if I can get a pointer here. Can you see that little dot? Yes. Okay. That little thing right here talks about a 10 minute, how many cues you get in a 10 minute period, what your rate is in a hundred minute period and a 60 minute period, et cetera. And if you look at this and you think I'm a little, little power, low power, little pistol station, that 99 is a pretty good rate for my type of station right there. You might think everything's going well and good. But if you look over here at this blue part, you can see the trend line is going down. So even though it says 99, I'm losing cues because I'm not going at the same rate that I was before. And that time was taken at uh, 50, 0050 in the contest. So when I started looking at that blue rate line over there, this was actually in the uh, an I, IARU contest, I said, I'm not making that rate. I got to do something a little bit different. So five minutes later, 0055, I've got a green line 10 minute rate of 190 an hour. And if you look at that blue line over there, this was five minutes later. What I actually did is shifted from a run to a search and pounce. Now, a lot of old timers and people who contest think that running is the only way to go, but not all the time using some of these tips, I'm getting some pretty decent rates out of it by jumping from spot to spot. Normally- So that's, the, that's a 190 cues in a 10 minute period if you kept the pace up that you were- The, last, the last 10 cues were entered at 190 an hour rate. That's what that's telling you. Gotcha. Right. And well. typically, what I get uh, on a domestic contest, again, I'm a little pistol station, I can get sustained rates of 80 to 120 for an hour or two just doing search and balance operation. Not all the time, but it's not unusual. And that's at the fairly low part of the sunspot cycle here. So, so looking at this, this screen right here, you're, you were running at 68 cues an hour. Right then, yes, but I'll go okay. back. And what you see here is the rate was 56 an hour, you know, 60 and 56. And five minutes later, I've got it up to, oops, where'd it go? Five minutes later, I've got it up a little bit higher. Oh, well, I'm going backwards. Is this CW or sideband? Uh, 7035 up here. At oh, the top. okay. Yeah, yep. so oh, sorry, CW. I missed that. Say that'd be yeah. CW for sure. Yeah. There, there's Good a lot for of information you. in Yeah. Here. Yeah. All right. So sometimes search and pounce will do better than a running station. And one of the things that uh, I always try to push and tell people is if what you're doing isn't given the rate that you want, 
do something different. And that's what Gary W9XT opened up at the beginning. If your running isn't good enough, shift to search and pounce. If your search and pounce isn't good enough, shift to run. Try something different. And a lot of people think, well, running, I got to keep running. I got to keep running. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, I was going to save this for a little bit later, but at the NQ4I Superstation, I was the 40-meter MOP op. And Jim, the E7ZO, uh, he actually won the 2006 uh, World WRTC Championship in Brazil. He was my 40-meter runoff and taught my, my contest mentor. And he was running on the 40-meter station, and I was the MOP op and doing some of the techniques that I'm going to talk about here, jumping from spot to spot, I was out, out rating him by about two to three to one. And he actually started shifting. So we were both doing search and pounce operations rather than running with a super station with stacked uh, 40 meter monobanders at 160 and I think 90 feet running 1500 watts. He shifted to search and pounce. So these things can help you and give you a tremendous amount of input from it. And that was what I'm trying to convince you for that. This is my desktop, or at least part of it. It gets pretty complicated for those of you who aren't uh, strong N1MM users. This is the band map part of uh, N1MM. We'll break these down as we go through. This is what I call the molten queue window. It shows you spots that are either just regular queues or molts, and a bunch of other information in there too. Do you question. look at that? Do you mind the questions or? No, go ahead. Okay. Do you do you look at the the available molts and cues window when you just to help make your decision to move from maybe a, a run rate that's starting to decline? Do you look to see available cues and to to or do you just go and search and pounce to try to bring it up? I look at it, and we'll talk about that in a minute or two. Okay. Uh, all right. The spectrum display is the band scope, which everybody knows. So let's tear into these individual pieces. We'll start out with a band map, and then we'll get to that multi Q window in a minute. Uh, this is what I first was presented as being spot operations. Uh, the spots came in, and they went on this little screen here. And you see that they're there, and you tune the VFO uh, manually, and you dial in the next station. And there's some color coding here, too. In this particular case, red is a molt. The blue R73 alpha is a uh, just regular QSO. And the gray RA6CM is a station that, I, that, that I've already worked. I can't get any points for them. Now, I like to leave them in there. So when I'm tuning across with a VFO and I see I start hearing something in my headphones, uh, I look at that uh, band map and I see, oh, that's probably RA6CM. So I just generally skip right over them. Uh, that doesn't mean somebody he didn't leave and somebody else went their place. But uh, as a general rule, uh, depending upon the contest, that's what it means. So until I work out all the other people, I'll generally just skip over grayed out stations. And that's how I first began to use spots. But that's not really too efficient. You get your spots typically from a cluster. And it was mentioned uh, before we started talking about VE7CC. And there's actually an external program called CC User, which uh, I do use a lot. It has better filtering capability than N1MM does. But you need to find the best cluster for you. And I'm not going to go through that while we're talking here. It takes too much time. But something to be aware of is clusters have their own command sets. And one of the things when I, I hear a common complaint to people when they hear me pushing spots, they say, well, I can't, I go to those spots and I never hear anything at all when I go to the spots. It's a good idea to filter the spots that come in so that you only get spots from stations that are in your general geographical area. And we'll see some of this in a minute. Doesn't do you any good to know that some guy over in England manages to hear a, uh, a rare malt uh, here in California or here in South Carolina. So filter it for the stations that are in your area. And uh, for CW, uh, and maybe for RIDI, I don't know. They've got a RIDI, our reverse beacon network thing now. Uh, it defaults to not show the RBM spots. Hey, so excuse me, Kevin? 
Yeah. Kevin, uh, to everybody else, mute yourselves. I'm getting tired of listening to Fred juggle dishes. Go <laughs> ahead, Kevin. All righty. I was about to say something too. Thanks. Appreciate it. So those are those are some things for general spots. Find a cluster that works for you, and then uh, uh, make sure that uh, you're getting the spots from the uh, uh, the cluster itself and filter so that you only get stations. You don't have to rely on a cluster though, and this is what a lot of people don't get. They think that uh, if you if you use the spot capabilities in N1MM, you got to be connected to a cluster, and that automatic make you assisted, and they don't want to be assisted. You can run your own personal skimmer, which is an assisted operation. But if you type a call in the entry window uh, and you don't manage to work them the first try, if you hit Alt-O, it'll automatically throw that call up on the band map. And it's just like taking a piece of paper and writing down that A61AJ is at uh, 28478. Uh, it's no different than that. It just throws it into the computer screen. And that is unassisted operation. And if you don't want to do the alt O, there's a command here or a, a checkbox in N1MM. I'll show you in a minute. Just by tuning off frequency, N1MM says, oh, he, he didn't work that person and he's tuning off frequency. I'll go ahead and throw that call up in the, in the band map too so you can use it later on. So you can do that and that is not assisted operation. This is the Telnet filter that you have available in N1MM and I got this orange box there. And notice you can within M1, N1MMM uh, filter out. In this case, I said only show me spots that come from people who have a prefix in K3, K4, or K8. Now it can be W8 or KN4 or whatever, but from regions three, four, and eight, you'll obviously have different ones. Uh, and you can change them around as much as you want. There is this thing over here they say tip, filter as many spots as you can at the cluster. It lowers the CPO workload on your computer. And it does. Uh, using CC user, it's much more convenient. And you can detail in by states and all kinds of things. Only give me spots from South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, for example, instead of all of Region 4. And that's very useful. But uh, you can dig into that on your own a little bit. And it does reduce some of the stuttering that can happen in your computer if you've got a bunch of things running. Now, a couple other things on here, I mentioned about some of the stuff that it does. I like to show those non-workable spots. So I check that checkbox at the top, show non-workable spots. And the one about QSY uh, wipes the calls and puts it in the band map. I leave that checked so that when I tune off, it automatically throws it in the band map for me. Now, I got one other red thing down here at the bottom, blacklisted spots. We'll talk about that in a screen or two, but that's where this checkbox is. And the other thing I'll mention up here is on this screen also, the spots will time out. In this case, it's set for about 20 minutes. You may want it longer. You may want it shorter. As you use, uh, uh, get to using spots more and more, you'll develop your own strategy for how long you want to leave them there and uh, have them pop up again. Any questions for I keep going here? Okay. Jim, I mentioned VE7ZO was a very competent operator and he used to smack me in the back of the head all the time because I'd always believe those spots when they were there. Well, I captured this screen and let's take a look at the top one up there. If you notice the top squared box on the right, it shows the same frequency, 7036. And RU1A is shown there, RE1A is shown there, and RM1A is shown there. Will the real spot station come up? If you just click on one, you're going to think there's another one there. You might get the wrong actual station listed. Down here, I always get excited when I see the chance green is a double multiple. And I click on the spot, and I may think I'm working W7RH, but... I might actually be working SN2B. You got to take the time to listen to what the person's call sign is and what their exchange is and make sure you're actually copying the person you think you are. Otherwise, those spots generate penalty points for you and it hurts. And here's another example down here that uh, you have the same thing. Usually N1SZ here would be the person you, we'd hear because he's between us and those other stations and he'd probably be louder. 
So we might think we're working that double malt UA9, but we're really we're working just a November 1 station up there. Cheese and malt too, but not a double malt. And that would generate some penalty points. K3LR, you might think, is a common type call, and it wouldn't be mistaken, but you've got to remember these are computers and uh, algorithms that are reading, in this case, Morse code. And if you look at the R, an R in Morse code is didadit, the skimmers at, in this case, W4KCN, that star or pound sign means it's a skimmer. The skimmers sometimes pick up that last dit in the R and they think it's an E in front of K3LR and they convert as called the EK3LR. That's a very common one that happens. And you'll see like back up here, you got all kinds of different things. A and M could be confused uh, by a skimmer. And uh, if it was RA1A, maybe the did it da was confused as RA by a skimmer. That stuff happens all the time. But EK3LR is a very common uh, broke or busted spot. And N1MM has the ability to actually list the calls that uh, are busted all the time so you can block them out and not have them appear on your spot list. Because when you have to, you've been up for 30 hours working a long contest, you get a little tired, you might not realize that instead of Armenia, you're working uh, K3LR up there in New England and end up getting that penalty point I talked about. In this particular contest, uh, D41CV kept getting busted a lot, and DX1CV. Uh, PJ2T was listed all the time as GJ2T. And after 20, 30 hours of correcting bad spots or trying to ignore them, I finally just put them, uh, took a slow period and put them in this bad pocket uh, packet spot call list so they didn't keep popping up all the time. The problem with that is there might actually be a GJ2T and he wouldn't be spotted. So you want to be a little careful with this. And P5NY? No, I don't think uh, North Korea was on there. That's probably Papa Papa 5NY and was a busted spot. If you decide to use this particular thing, you got to remember the next contest, you might want to take these out in case GJ2T really is in there. And uh, that way you don't keep carrying them over from time to time. BAM map, you navigate in a couple ways. You turn in the VFO is one. Another way that people talk, that point and click, you can reach over here with the mouse and click on it, and it'll cause your rig to jump to wherever it's supposed to be. But I don't like having to take my hand off the keyboard and reach over to a mouse all the time. I like my hands on the keyboard, so I'm ready to type in the call or exchange information. There are shortcuts in N1MM, and a couple of them that run off the band map. <clears throat> if you hit Control plus the up or Control plus down arrow, it'll move back and forth across the calls that are listed in the band map. And if you hit control all up or down, it'll move not, it'll skip, for example, if you're on the EA8 station, it'll jump to the next malt. So it'd skip R73A, it'd skip RA6M, and it'd go down here to the C, uh, skip the CQ frequency, and it'd go to the A61AJ station, jump to the next malt. So it's good to learn these uh, shortcut methods. Uh, until they become second nature as you go through this too. So that's how you can navigate the band map. And if you get a, band, a bad spot, you can, uh, if they're in your entry window, you the call like if P3A was in it and you knew it was a bad spot and D3A was in your entry window, you hit Alt D and it would remove that spot. Or you could right click on it and it'll bring up a menu and then hit delete. And I was real happy. I've got one of those mouses with a, uh, wheel in the center of it that you can push down and it uh, clicks. And if you push that wheel down while you're over one of these calls, it'll make the spot go away too. So that's useful for making bad spots go away so they don't stay on your bad map. And the other thing about this is after using this for a while, I've got a Yagi up at about 50 feet and uh, these spots are not in order. So a lot of times the next, next spot that would pop turn up would be like, for example, here's a JR at 16 degrees from me right next to an EA8 at 223 degrees. Uh, well, not from me, wherever I stole this picture from. So those things just don't jive together. So 
there's got to be a better way to use this band map and, and, and spot capabilities. And that's where the molten Q window comes in. Now, I think it uh, was Ted, I think, was just asking about, do I use this thing? Before we get into the spots down here at the bottom, this section right here, I use a lot. A lot of information in that particular section. This tells you the red, where the most bolts are, what band has the most molts. Since 80 and 40 has two each, they're both highlighted, but the most cues are on 20 meters. Now, if you're looking at this and you're thinking, uh, do I need to shift bands? Ask yourself a question. Is this daytime going to night so that 80 and 40 are picking up? If so, those molts are likely to be there but the 15 and the 20 molt are probably going to go away. If this, that was the case, it was day moving into night, I might take a second and move over and try to pick up that 15 meter molt before it goes away for good. And vice versa, so if this was nighttime going to day, I might try to get that 80 and 40 meter molt before I do it. So this helps me determine how many molts are there and how many cues and I use that for kind of a, a guide as to whether I should be shifting bands or not uh, through there. It's kind of useful for that information. Did that answer your question about that? I think it was Ted. I'll assume so. Okay. The molten Q window, <clears throat> when I first was introduced to it, I was told, you know, as a mult operator at a super station, I was told, Go ahead and set it up so the new molts come at the top. And most everybody knows you got to jump on a new molt right away before the big pileup starts. And uh, that was how I'd started using this thing for years. And that kind of worked okay. But uh, there are better ways to use this molten Q window. And I forgot about this. Here I said, notice who's creating these spots, like an EA3 is spotting another EA3 and things. These things aren't very useful, which is why you want to filter your spots for only your local stations. You can filter this molten Q window so it only shows you molts. And you can go through this list and hit the multipliers first and then go back and pick up the cues later. That's a great way to try to uh, uh, increase your score very quickly and very useful for that information. Uh, I didn't quickly bust the pile up for a couple of these people. And I typed in, I moved to them and their call appeared in my entry window. And when I moved off and N1MM, I had it set up so it would spot it for me. It said, okay, somebody else had originally spotted that, but you typed in his call and moved off. So he must really be there. So now it converts it to say that I found uh, that that person and that's, that is a good call on that particular frequency. That tells me a little bit more about what, uh, whether I can trust that spot or not, because if I would jump to that station and it had a bad call in there, I would have changed the call in the entry window. And now because that's in there, I can jump back and go back and forth to them later on. Here's what I use this molten Q window for a lot. I'll go ahead and use these columns and sort it not by time, but I'll use it by direction or frequency. When I'm on some of the lower bands, or excuse me, the higher bands with my tri-bander, I'll sort it by direction and I'll point my tri-bander in that general direction. And then I'll go down and I'll work the stations that are about 280 degrees most of you California people in this case. And then when I start getting down here to these guys, uh, notice it's up to about 294. I might bump the beam a few more degrees and I'll start working these guys here. And then as I go down the list, I'll bump it a little bit more each time. And that's kind of useful for me to do that uh, by direction. Now, if this is a <clears throat> omnidirectional antenna, like I've got an inverted V out there or an elevated vertical, I'll just go ahead and sort it by frequency and move up or down the list from that way. Uh, it's a good way to do it. The other thing about a molten Q window is just like the band map, they've got some shortcut keys, Alt-A and Shift-Alt-A. It jumps from the uh, spots that are shown in the molten Q window, and it makes it very useful to go through the list that way, up and down. And if you have the filter set to molts only, 
using uh, alt a and shift alt a you'll jump from alt to mult to mult without having to reach over and click on the individual things again it increases your score quite quite quickly before i started using so2r and had bandpass filters and everything <clears throat> i figured out that i could sort this by frequency and i could tell this molten q window we'll look at how in a minute or two I could tell this molten Q window to show me all the spots that are on 10, 15, and 20 meters when they were all open at the same time. And then I could go ahead and tell it, show me 10, 15, and 20 meters. And this doesn't show it that way, but I'd have those, those set up that way. And I could also do it by direction, have direction first and then frequency. And I could jump back and forth using the tri-bander and just jump from spot to spot no matter what band they were on just by using that alt a or shift alt a method back and forth and that worked really well too really made an improvement in my scores as i went on you can do by two columns as i just mentioned a minute there why you would do it by call i don't really know uh, during a contest but it does help you find a particular person if you're looking for them this is the summary window that happens when you click on this bands and modes or there's a drop down menu, but if you click on this, you can tell it it's either a focus radio or non focus radio, what bands to be on, what mode to be on, and you can specify what spots show up in the molten Q window. Uh, very useful to have. Now, one thing that's bit me before, this is for a CW contest. I've gone the next contest and has turned out to be a phone contest, but I forgot to unclick CW and click phone. And when I started the contest, nothing appeared in here. That made it kind of a, a pain figuring out here I am trying to use spots, nothing to pop up. But I usually keep this thing open. And I think I got this somewhere else, maybe on this screen. I generally don't set it up if you're an SO2 operator for focus radio or non-focus radio. I tell it whatever band I've got my second radio or VFO on, just give me spots for that that I'm using for search and pounce while I'm using the main one for, for running. That way, if I'm in the middle of a run and I use one of those uh, Alt-A or Shift-Alt-A keys, uh, I had been doing it, hitting the the key at the wrong time and causing my run radio to jump off frequency. So I, I stopped doing that. And I usually only select a band that my second radio or VFO is on. Save me a little bit of trouble that way. And that's basically what that talks about right there. Oh, the other thing about this is if you do have a second receiver uh, or something like that, uh, it works really well to use that method and then use the macro capabilities of N1MM to send you messages. Here's N1MM band scope. This is nice and clear. Most people know if you got one, how to use these things. But in a contest, it looks a little bit different. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I prefer to have mine uh, vertical so that the calls and uh, things run from right to left instead of up and down and it's less complicated. But as I started using this thing, I don't care how complicated this is at all. And here's the reason why. They got this funny little blue line right here in N1MM. And that represents a receive threshold for <laughs> N1MM. And if you use your wheel, you can make that blue line go up and down and only recognize have N1MM recognize signals that are stronger and ignore signals that are weaker than wherever that threshold of that blue line is. And if it's stronger, you can tell it to go ahead and set up this little red dot right here. And these red dots represent stations that you have not worked before. Notice here's a signal that doesn't have a red dot. It's a station that I've worked before. Same with this VE5MX no red dot, I've worked him before, but I haven't worked these guys over here. Although this is so complicated, N1MM has the capability of jumping from red dot to red dot to red dot. And I don't really need to know what the calls are up here because the calls will appear in the window, entry window of N1MM as the rig jumps to those red dots. So that's kind of a very useful feature too, to go through 
uh, using the automated capabilities. Now, when the band scopes open, I don't have to tune the VFO, although I, I do that uh, to find the stations that aren't spotted. I can use shift up and down arrows and jump from spot to spot to get the unworked signals. One thing that started biting me when I did this is if you notice these colors up here in the band scope of N1MM, they have dark blue and they have a light blue. And that represents the dark blue is the active signal on that band. And the light blue is what it used to be before. It just hasn't decayed off yet. There's a decay constant that can be set for it. <clears throat> and if you have that decay constant set quick, the signal decays right away and these red dots disappear, even though you haven't worked the station. So I set that decay period be long so that those red dots stay there longer. And when I jump from station to station, I hit more of the stations that I haven't worked before. Makes it very useful. And for example, here, if you work somebody a grade RA6CM, it just skips right over them. So you don't work them anymore. Another useful feature in the band map is Alt-M. A lot of times they'll be tuning across the bands, uh, particularly on 80 meters at night. And uh, there's a lot of people just rag to and not in the contest. And they'll appear as a signal on the band map, or as I'm tuning my VFO, I'll start to hear them in, in my headphones. And if you hit Alt-M, even though you don't know what the guy's call sign is, it'll just mark that the, the frequency is busy. And that way, you know, next time you come through on a, on a pass that you don't have to stop at that particular frequency and you can skip right over. Them. So we've talked about these sections of it. We've uh, talked a little bit about uh, spots being bad. But one again, I want to mention that never trust spotted call signs. Always verify them. And there are some keys in N1MM entry window that will help you figure that out. If you got this check window open up here and you have a, a super check partial file loaded, whatever is in this entry window, N1MM will look up here in the super check partial and it'll see if that's a call that's been used in contests and has been logged in people's logs within the last couple of years. And if it has, it'll put a little check mark right there saying that this is probably a valid call. Doesn't mean it is, but it means it's probably a valid call giving you a little bit more uh, confidence that uh, that is a good spot. So I've started looking at that a lot as well. But here's an example of a spot W9ZN, which this is entry window for radio two it looked at W9ZN and it didn't find it in the super check partial. So it put a question mark there saying, this, this may not be a good spot for you. And if I looked up there, this part of the check log window is says I've worked W9NZ before. Uh, so probably W9ZN is uh, maybe not a good spot. W9NZ might be a good spot. And this section of the check log is what the actual super check partial shows is things it thinks might be possible. I apologize for this being fuzzy, but I kind of blow it up. Instead of W9ZN, it thinks, well, maybe it's W9NZ, maybe it's W9ZV, it gives you some other options. But again, W9ZN isn't there, so it put that question mark in it. But one thing that makes me curious about it is remember before I mentioned this little pound sign meant it come from a skimmer. A skimmer picked this up and a skimmer may get those dits or dots wrong or drop a character or something. Uh, but <clears throat> it's thinking what it heard was W9ZN. I don't really know what's going on with this call. I just know that N1MM really questions it. So I'm going to take a little bit of extra care and verify what call that is before I accept it in my log and go on. Um, before we move on, if you had logged W9ZN, I've noticed then in if you have your log book window open, 
the call is is highlighted in like an amber is is that why because it, it didn't correct okay. uh, i'm not going to open up n1mm but like he's saying if you have a log window open too it'll come up in amber uh, highlight and say suggest to you that uh, that's kind of a unique call that it hasn't been used in a couple of years same principle there but if I usually have my log window personal personally up high in the uh, uh, my screens, I've got four monitors here, and it's up at the top of my, the the screens, uh, so that I don't usually see it being amber. I've just gotten used to looking at that. I use the real estate uh, right above the entry windows more for this check log and for my uh, band scopes. So it all depends on how you lay it out, whether that's useful or not. <laughs> After I started using all these shortcut keys and twisting my fingers all around to get control shift alts and A's and all that kind of crap, after about 15, 20 hours, I started getting hand cramps. And I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. So I went out and bought me one of these macro keyboards, which not everybody likes the larger keyboards, but I programmed those uh, shortcut keys into this gaming keyboard. So instead of hitting control shift alt A, I just hit that single macro button on the left of my keyboard and it jumps uh, to molten queue up, molten queue down or scope, band scope up, band scope down and uh, saves me some of that uh, uh, problems. I also have these things color coded uh, based on what I'm doing to help me find out after I've been doing 30 hours, uh, color code helps bring my eyes to where it's supposed to be. And I know you can use templates and things, but I haven't found a good template that lays out on this keyboard nicely yet. So I just change them out for every contest that I do as part of my pre-contest checks. In general, don't forget the VFO. Getting there first is the best way to beat the pile up. And as I said, every time I turn the VFO, I find people. And I particularly use the bands or the uh, spectrum display when I'm uh, turning the VFO and I look for stations that are weak, hidden close to stronger stations. And that band scope really helps me figure that stuff out a little, little bit. And while I'm turning the VFO, looking primarily at the band scope, my eyes also keep drifting back down to the band map to see if the who I'm about to tune up on is a, uh, uh, a busy station, meaning not in the contest or a dupe or what the case may be. So because the complicated uh, band scope is kind of hard to read sometimes. So my eyes, when I'm tuning the VFO, are always going back and forth a lot. Again, if you're running and your rate drops, something might be wrong. And if you've got your filters in place to only show stations that are in your general spots from station in your general region, uh, you may not know that somebody that's out of your ground wave distance uh, but also out there in California just came on frequency. And now the two of you are calling CQ on the same frequency. So if my rate drops unexpectedly or I start hearing people answering, uh, answering or calling with their exchanges that doesn't seem to be in sync with me, sometimes I'll remove those local filters and see, see what the world is spotting. And I discover that somebody else moved in on frequency on top of me. Uh, whether you choose to participate in a frequency fight is up to you, but generally speaking, one of the best practices is try, but if you're a little pistol like me, it's generally best to move off. Effective spots, a spot use plan. Here's how I do it. First thing I do is I make one or two passes through the band with the molten queue window set to molts only and pick those up. Then I'll go ahead and open it up and show all the cues that are on the band and go through a couple more times. Then I'll go ahead and point the beam in a certain direction and I will use the band scope to jump to the red dots. The good thing about the band scope in those uh, red dot method is it only brings up signals that are strong and you can adjust that little blue line so that you've got a real good shot of being heard at the other end. So you can play with that a little bit and start to get a feel for where that needs to be so you can bust the pileups on the other end. And then after I go through using the band scope, then I'll make a, a, a pass or two through just using the VFO and look through it. And then I'll start all over and repeat the process again. 
A couple of gotchas and things that have bit me before is don't forget what type of contest it is. Remember back there when I was talking about the molten Q window options, I said uh, I would sometimes leave it to be show me CW spots and it'll be a sideband contest. That kind of messes you up a little bit. Uh, another thing about these spots that bit me a few times is when people put in spots, uh, it also puts in the mode in most cases. And when you click on a spot, it can N1MM can be set up so that your rig will change to the mode that the spot is on. Uh, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. You just got to be prepared for it. If all of a sudden you, your radio shifts modes on you, that's probably what happened. And the band plan settings are configurable. If you can tell your radio to when it's in a certain part of the band to go into this mode or that mode, <clears throat> I generally prefer it to be contest mode or radio mode. And this is what that screen looks like. It's under the N1MM configure down here. This is set to use radio mode, follow band plan, use contest mode or band plan, always use one or the other. So that's part of my pre-contest setup too, is deciding how to set that particular uh, uh, configuration setup. I gotcha. This one's bit me more than once. Uh, say you, the spot come in from a, a, VE7, a VE station and uh, they're allowed to work down there at uh, uh, 7060 sideband. And I click on the spot and all of a sudden it puts my, uh, I thought I was in split mode and it shifts to non-split mode or vice versa. Uh, somebody else may be split and your radio goes off and puts you in split. So you gotta pay attention when you're doing spots, what, what mode your rig is doing. Uh, and that's basically what I just said. Another thing about spots is you click on them, it'll take you out of your band. Again, that uh, VE station, uh, maybe you've thrown that spot up there, takes you down into a place on lower sideband where it's not good to operate. Here's one that just bit me, uh, my last log check report. Although I know this stuff and I'm talking to you about it, I clicked on a spot at 14349, uh, which is upper sideband, and I worked a guy down there. Well, of course, when I did that, my upper sideband signal took me out of band for uh, 20 meters and I got penalized for it and a few extra points taken off, which I really deserved. Uh, another thing that happens a lot is somebody will park right on 7125, which is lower sideband. If you work them, you're out of band there too. So, And I have seen particularly Russians like to do this uh, a bit, a couple of times uh, set down there 100 hertz above uh, a little band of 40 meter CW and run 35 words a minute. And the uh, band with your signal takes you out of the band down there too. So try to pay attention where your spots are and what your frequency allocations are. Uh, last thing here I'll talk about <clears throat> is be a good sport, help out. Uh, hit Alt P, if you work somebody that's there, hit Alt P and I'll throw them up and spot them so that you don't have to uh, depend upon the reverse beacon network for CW, especially on sideband, it helps out. Uh, it's good <laughs> etiquette, makes people happy about it, and it makes more fun for the running station as well. So that's pretty much all I got. Any questions? Uh, let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I thank you for the opportunity. Did you say you're, you're able to sort in the uh, available mult cues? You're able to sort by band and also by by uh, azimuth, by direction? I did. Let me okay. open up N1M and then I don't know if I can show you anything, but. Uh, I have mine open here and I was, I was just, I, I use a lot of the techniques that you, that you showed today, but I, I wasn't okay. these two stations and they're both at 20 degrees so, and they're in the same frequency okay i don't have anybody loaded in here but notice this says direction and there's a single carrot and that says call and there's a double carrot if i wanted to go by direction and then frequency uh man it's not gonna do it i've done it before Yeah, well, I don't, you don't have any, oh, no spot. I'll have to figure that one out. 
yeah. yeah there's no there's no spots in there so and i only have two okay. right now and they're yeah. um the same azimuth the same band yeah i'll figure that out and get it back to you yeah i i i, I, I just got, one sec doug i just got sure. the band, band map up and running and i've uh, used it in a couple of cwts and and it's really the the red dots once you get your noise threshold or your signal threshold set correctly um it's it's really nice and i wasn't aware of the alt um in the band map too um or the uh alt a in the mults and cues so you've given i learned a few uh tricks to uh try out and another one not dealing with spots that uh, a lot of people have been very happy to learn is control U. If you're in a uh, contest that uh, has sequential serial numbers uh, and you type in a sequential serial number and then you don't get through, you got to retype it again to get the next number. If you got a number in there and you hit control U, it increments it by one. So you don't have to retype oh. the number over and over. Oh, nice. You know, I, I just I just did the WAE uh, and they have the the QTCs. And yep. boy, that was that was a lot of fun. That how and the integration with N1MM is just unbelievable. It's just a couple of keystrokes and it sends out, you know, zero to ten, whatever QTCs you want to send or have available. Yeah. I actually used Excel and I created a uh uh, shortcut cheat sheet, which I have posted up next to the shack. So if I forget some of these, I can just glance up there instead of having to try to look through the manual while I'm doing a contest. That helps too. Yeah, I know a lot. I I have a lot of uh, like templates or little post-it notes all over the key, all around the keyboard. And so, anyways, thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, my. Uh, mine was ba questions based on that spectrum map. Um, you're, you, I, I quickly saw you're using a um, SDR play. Is it was that difficult to set up, or I I have not done done that. I have an uh, an RSP, uh, but I I use it just for casual listening and looking for the band conditions and things like that. I have two TS five nineties and neither one of them have a band scope built in. So I was forced to use <clears throat> external uh, devices. And once I used the jumper method in the TS-590 to get a uh, IF signal out, it's just a matter of plugging it into the SDR play. Now, once you do that, there are step-by-step -step instructions in the N1MM user manual, which work perfectly to set it up. He actually recommends use the AirSpy HF Plus series over the SDR, but I don't see a lot of difference between the two of them. <clears throat> I've got an H, uh, HF Discovery Plus for one and the SDR uh, RSP2 for the other, and it works real well. Uh, it's just a matter of setting up the uh, uh, options within the drivers for SDR as to how much bandwidth it has and how much CPU processor time that it uses. He actually uh, has also developed, uh, you probably know about it, N1MM SDR server, I think it's called, where it offloads the spectrum scope processing into a separate thread if you've got a multi-thread like i5 or i7 processor and uh, makes N1MM run a little bit quicker without stuttering quite so much. And uh, that was useful. But to set up, to answer your question, no, it's really quite easy and straightforward. Didn't take me any time at all once I got the, the TS590s set up. All right, that's great. That, related to that, you mentioned those processors. Um, do you have a recommendation there? Least I5 or better? I prefer an i7. Uh, okay. I'm, I do a lot of, I haven't done a lot of ready work yet, but I'm going to get into it FSK. But besides the spectrum scopes and the spectrum display, I also used to run the real time ham cap uh, processing. I have open uh, the internet for uh, uh, chats and email. 
I'm connected to the real-time score servers and uh, have a couple other things open. And having a fast processor with a lot of RAM for me is the only way to go. Hey, Kevin, this is Roger. I got two questions. Uh, first of all, I have a flex, so I haven't been paying much attention to the N1N and M-M band scope, but boy, the red dots got my attention. Well, what I will offer to you is <clears throat> N4IQ does fairly well, and he also had, runs two TS590s. And he said he hated the N1MM band map. Uh, he liked the other that comes out of the SDR uh, world better. And since I showed him this red dot stuff, he switched over and is 